And that is the end of the people we have scheduled to do presentations. At this time, we have a little time, so if you have questions for any of the presenters, assuming they're still here, uh, we'd be happy to take questions. I have one, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, right. Yeah. You know, I listened to the last two presentations on wildlife, and uh, I was struck by the fact that there's only one study that's been done in, in Vermont, New Hampshire. It was done by a Vermonter, it appears, but on a New Hampshire project. And yet now we have um, uh, several projects in service. Are there any plans, I guess I'm asking John Austin as much as anybody, are there any plans to work with uh, 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 institutions, um, be it UVM or another uh, college in this area, and try to work now that we have a laboratory and see uh, what sort of effect we may actually be having on, uh, on wildlife? Well, I appreciate you raising that. I actually didn't to mention it at the, uh, the conclusion of my presentation. Um, so the answer is yes. We, we have a study that's uh, ongoing right now. And in fact, um, you, the board, had commissioned several years ago, and it's associated with the Deerfield Wind Project. Uh, at the moment, we have some 13, 15 bears wearing GPS radio collars on them. And they're throughout that general area, the, the Searsburg region, and we're monitoring their, their movements, behavior, and habitat use uh, as we speak. Um, the hope has been, and presumably this will still be the case, that we would collect before and after information on their behavior and use of habitats associated with the, uh, the expansion of the, the Searsburg Wind Project. So, um, I, I think we've, we've got a lot of potential to learn some important information from that effort. Um, and frankly, I, we'll, we're already learning a lot about what areas are important for the bears and um, when and how they're using and accessing them. But you know, the point of it was to understand their, their behavior relationship to a new wind project. And uh, that requires that the new wind project be constructed, of course. I also have a question for you. Awesome. I have a question. I'm here. here. No. Can you can you rest me here? Um, so my question is, you um, had a lot of slides about the wild, different species reaction to um, to different situations. You had um, oil drilling, natural gas, traffic was a couple of times. Um, the noise from compressors, military ordnance, and ski resorts. So I'm wondering, since the inference um, I was drawing was that th this was related to the noise from those different um, situations or man-imposed um, um, technologies, uh, was there also a, uh, any data on what the noise levels were at those different um, sites? Well, that, that's a great question, and in, uh, in most of the studies, the papers offered information on the, the sound decibel levels. And I have included that in some of them. I should have included it in all of them. Um, if that's information that would be helpful for the board, I would be glad to summarize it in the table, perhaps, or I could even just provide the studies themselves. Well, I would find it interesting in the Sure, I'd be happy to. So just to, to have the table of what the different decibel levels um, sure. were of these different um, uh, situations. I'm happy to do that. Sorry. That's true. Could you repeat that? We could hear that. There's an important distinction. You can't compare the numbers with the ones you're used to seeing because what he's we're going to provide you is not an A-weighted level. Well, I don't know what he's going to provide me with, but if that could be noted or otherwise contextualized, that could be helpful. So one of the things I noticed in, in some of the other presentations was that the, the um, terminology was uh, you know, DBA, I guess, right? Mm -hmm. And in the studies that I was looking at, it was DB. Mm -hmm. I'm, but I'm not an expert on, on sound. That's you know, one of my limitations. So I'm not sure what that distinction is. Okay. So if you provide the study, then if anybody else wants to comment on how we should what, on, on how we should interpret it, that would be fine. We can follow up or apply comments to, to whatever Mr. Austin provides us. Right now, I'm 
now going back to other questions. Yes, sir. Please state your name. Kim Freed of Newark, Vermont. Um, you're just taking questions? Questions to the people who presented. Okay. And a uh, uh, three word comment is um, I'm really annoyed uh, about hearing uh, annoyance. Uh, uh, again and again, that, that word keeps coming up. I'd like to ask Dr. Gross or Dr. Irwin. Uh, what kind of outreach you you mentioned that you you uh, uh, you encourage doctors and, and people that are having problems or think they're having problems with annoyance uh, uh, to get in touch with you? Uh, what kind of outreach do you have uh, going on to uh, reach out to the doctors in those areas? Uh, and the people in those areas. Um, mostly it's been passive uh, through public forum like this saying that you know we want people to, to reach out to us first to go to their doctors and have them contact us. Um, but we've been discussing doing it in a more active way so there's a health alert network and so uh, the idea is that we would send statewide uh, a message, doctors subscribe to this health alert network and, and inform them, if you're seeing patients who are complaining of symptoms related to, to wind turbines, um, that you know, we'd like to hear your professional assessment of, of what they're telling you. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Robin Clark from Lowell, and this was a follow-up to that question. We have sent in complaint cards with noise and health issues to the Department of Public Service, They've never been, from what we understand, they've been, never been forwarded to the Department of Health. They go to Green Mountain Power, and then we get called from Green Mountain Power following through. But nobody from any of the departments has ever called a neighbor to find out or follow through on any of these health or noise issues. And that is my question. I mean, why isn't that happening? And also, with wildlife, aren't they considering talking to the neighbors to see what changes have happened in the neighborhood as far as wildlife? It's a phone call. It, it does it have to be a funded study? Isn't there some place to start? I think there's someone from the Department of Health or, or from uh, uh, which other agency? Fish and Wildlife. Fish and Wildlife want to respond to this. Well, I'm Jeff Collins. I'm the Director of Public Advocacy at the Public Service Department. And uh, I believe that when people call or contact our Consumer Affairs Division with complaints about uh, wind turbines that, are, that, that have health uh, aspects to them, they are, we suggest that they talk to their doctors and that they have their doctors contact the health department. I believe that's a fairly routine, although I can't. Well, it's the first I've heard of that, too. Okay, I'm sorry. That's so. Uh, we'll look into that further. Here, here, here. Uh, in terms of in terms of doing investigations, we simply don't have the staff to, to call around to a lot of people and try to. Um, well, my question study. was, I'm surprised that it's not forwarded to the Department of Public Health, and the Department of Public Health hasn't gotten more involved. I take your comment to heart, and I will make that happen. Yes, in the back of the room. Well, that was John Austin was supposed I have a question. to respond to. Uh, my name is Keith Ballack. I live in Sheffield. Um, when you're taking into consideration all these broad studies, peer, peer review, or whatever, I mean, a lot of it's coming from all different parts of the world. I mean, can we just focus on Vermont type terrain? I mean, you may get a study from a, an area that's flat, might have a totally different type of turbine. It could be a, a lot smaller. Uh, the, the whole topography is, can be totally different than New England type terrain. So we have three perfect laboratories, or whatever you want to call it, that we can use. And we should be studying Vermont type terrain and the type of turbines that we're dealing with now, not diluting it. To me, this is a form of the American Wind Energy Association, which I know one of the doctors here, I don't know if he was employed by or supported by, or whatever, on the board. Um, 
I think they're trying to dilute the whole noise study by adding all types of terrain, different countries. We don't even know what type of turbines they're using. Uh, and, and it should be focused on what we have here, Vermont terrain and the type of turbines that are up right now, not a couple 200 footers that are out in the field somewhere a few miles away from someone. Let's, I think we need to focus on, on the Vermont or New England type terrain, or it, it's, it could be irrelevant. It's dilution. I think they're diluting the process, and that's what I think they want to do. And that's all I have to say. I, I hope. Do you think we can do something like that to narrow it? I, I'm, not, I'm not prepared to answer that right now. We're here to get comments. And okay, well, that's my comment. It should be more focused on what we're dealing with here, not with what they're dealing with overseas or out in Europe, maybe out in a cornfield with a 150 foot turbine. And, you know, that's my thought. Let's, you know, keep it focused on what's going on right here in Vermont. Yep. My name's John Lewandowski from Newark. Um, it was brought up by Lauren Knopper. Public opinion on wind, and this has come up a lot of times, is overwhelmingly in favor of wind power, 80%. What's the qualifications of these people that they're asking? Do they even know about wind power? Have they studied anything about wind power? Because they are definitely afterwards say that somebody who is affected by the wind, oh, it's like, well, you know, that's just their opinion. They're, they're close to it, but yeah, it's, it's only their opinion. But they're more than, more than um, anxious to say that they're supporting wind. And I find, I worked for a power company for almost 30 years in generation for about half of that time. And I find that the more people are educated about wind power, the cost and effects of wind power, you'll find that more people will go against wind power. It's probably about the worst way of generating electricity for what you're getting as to what you're losing. But once you talk to the people, they find this out. Everybody likes to say 80% of Vermont wants it. They round up when it's that way. They round down when they start talking about, well, it's only a small percentage. Do we throw those people away because they're sick? Do we only have medications in this world for cancer and heart disease? No. These people, these 3% of the population get sick with other things. We try to treat them too. We don't throw them away. So I think that, I think that these experts need to look at it and more, put things in perspective. That's just what I would say. That's it. That's what I have to say. All right. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay. Yeah. Kevin. Um, my name is Kevin McGrath. I, I'm an abutter to the Lowell Project. And uh, one of my concerns that I have, and I'll pose this as a question to the board, is that prior to the installation of the Lowell Project, there was an agreement that is publicly known between the landowner and Green Mountain Power that the landowner would hold Green Mountain Power harmless from noise emissions during construction and operation of the project. Since the project's been become a reality, came into fruition, Green Mountain Power has purchased my neighbor's home that is approximately 600 feet from my home uh, for $20,000 over the assessed value. We publicly know that the Nelson Farm has been purchased by Green Mountain Power. Uh, as a settlement. We know that the former day home that I referenced to as far as my neighbor goes is now occupied by one of the uh, employees by Vestas, the turbine manufacturer, who's gone public and said there are no noise levels. I live in Vermont approximately six months out of the year because my work takes me out of the United States. If I get up at 2 o'clock in the morning and I check my decibel meter and I look at it and it says 30 dBA. Well, if I take my faucet in my house and it's dripping constantly, it's less than 30 dBA. But I can't shut that faucet off. And it is a nuisance. There are times when the levels go up much higher. Again, as I said earlier, for six months out of the year I'm not here. Otherwise I'd be complaining more. Generally speaking, you go to Jeff Commons group, they send it over to Green Mountain Power, 
and it just comes back with a bunch of broken promises. Send a look into it. I'm an engineer by trade. I've been in the utility industry in my past life as well. So I understand power production quite well. And I'll ask for certain criteria. What happened? What was the noise levels? What was the wind direction? They have all this information. They never give it to me. They promise it to me, but they never give it to me. And since the Nelson home has been sold, the noise levels have gone up dramatically. And all the neighbors around the area have witnessed this, and as you have as well. So basically, talking about the uh, purchase of the two homes that has gone way over the assessed value, talk about the agreement between the landowner and Green Mountain Power, where Green Mountain Power specifically knew the noise levels were going to go up, because they, why would they write that in the contract, in the lease agreement? My question to the board is, Mr. Brick, you've always been concerned about quality of life after these turbines, okay? My quality of life has gone, gone to hell in a handbasket since the turbines have come up. Nobody wants my home. The locals all know about my home and what's happened up there, up on Farm Road and Lowell. Everybody knows about it. It's not even a secret anymore. It's not even a discussion. The purchase of those homes and the way the agreement was written between the landowner and Green Mountain Powell, doesn't that concern the Department of Public Service at all? Doesn't that, or the Public Service Board, doesn't that give you a heads up that something isn't right? How hard is it to figure out? I'm not sure exactly what, what, when you say the way the contract was written. I, I don't know what you're talking about, but the details you're talking about. It's factual. Right. It's factual. It's but public record. We're, we're not able to answer that. Right, right. The, the purpose of today's, uh, the last meeting we had about this was where people could come in and talk, tell us about the actual um, events that were happening at their homes that bothered them about the wind turbines. And, and I think you were there for that. I'm not sure if you were. I was there. Okay. Uh, uh, this, today's, today's, uh, uh, the purpose of today's is to hear from the experts. And if you have questions for the experts, then we're happy to hear them. As far as your concerns that you've raised just now, uh, if you want to send in a complaint, uh, um, Send us a letter and a complaint, and we'll. I, I appreciate that, Mr. Holtz, but, but in I, can't actual, do, I can't deal with it today. Yeah, I appreciate that. But it is noise related. Yeah. Yes, sir. Uh, yeah, I was wondering uh, with the health department, Vermont Health Department, do they have the funds to conduct a, uh, you know, a preliminary type study in these areas, in the in the three areas where we have wind turbines? On, on people's health? I, I don't know. Since yeah. the Department of yeah. Health yeah. yeah. answer that question? Uh, generally, no. There, there would have to be some source of funds. It's, uh, there's all kinds of... Why are we doing these projects if we don't have the funds to, to, to check out the health of our own people first? As we've requested, or as we've recommended today, the process of a health impact assessment is one tool that could be used to assess a wide variety of ways that an energy project could affect a uh, community and individuals in a community. And one of the ways that that could be funded is to uh, require that of the petitioner to the board who is uh, seeking to have that energy project. We're just at the beginning of that process, making that kind of recommendation. Uh, we'll see where it goes from today. Other questions? Yeah, I just have one question to the Vermont Wildlife Department. Uh, do you have any funds to, uh, to uh, make assessments on wildlife and, and how they're affected by wind power? Generally speaking, our, our funding for that kind of research is very limited. Research of that nature is extremely expensive. Um, the study that we're doing now the Wind Project, for instance, which, by the way, you know, is, a, is a result of the Public Service Board order, is uh, the cost of that is being borne by the developer, although money's fast pointing out. But that's for the two and a half million dollars. Um, you know, these are complex 
issues to look at and, and it takes a lot of time and a lot of money in order to do it. One of the things I would note though is, and I also forgot to mention, is that for every one of these projects, um, we've asked for and the board has required uh, reconstruction assessments on bird and bat migration and post-construction assessments on bird and bat mortality. So at least in terms of that issue, we're gathering information and learning more to hopefully guide some, some better decisions. Yeah. Uh, Cynthia Barber, Newark, um, to the Health Department. Given that there are reports of, and I know several people personally, who are badly affected by the presence of turbines in their neighborhood, what does the Department of Health plan on doing about it? Even if each person got his or her doctor to send you something, what would you do with that information? I think it's terrible that people are so badly affected and they're just being dismissed. Yes, our, our pro process of asking individuals to see their health care practitioner is an important one because it's a relationship that is established for a whole variety of reasons for that patient. You know, you've been seeing a doctor for years, you have a good relationship and you're able to communicate effectively. And the physician obviously is a specialist in trying to assess the patient, assess the history. But what will you and do? And what we would do is on the basis of the physician's diagnosis, if there is something that we can actually affect, we would try to take that uh, action. And so far, none of the physician uh, reports that we have received indicate that there is a problem that is directly related to the wind turbines. However, uh, it doesn't mean that we're getting all of the reports that might be out there. And it could be that one of the efforts that uh, could improve the process is to have, as uh, Dr. Grass mentioned, a health alert network to the physicians and other health care providers to uh, make sure that they understand that if there are patient reported concerns about their health related to a wind turbine project, to speak with their physician, to get that documented, and then have the physician contact us. Dr. Ryder, Dr. have Dr. you Ryder. reported yeah. your patients to uh, the uh, department? Just, just uh, to report my own experience, I have been in contact with the health department on two or three occasions, uh, twice in person, and reported my findings, which I felt were definitely due to the proximity of the winter. It's the same patients described in that report. And I was listened to very politely and treated very well and told that uh, they weren't concerned about individual cases and nothing was done. Thank you, Sandy. It's pretty okay. disheartening. Any other questions? Yes. Yes. Um, I wonder, I'm not a health specialist, but to the Department of Health. Um, sorry, Gabrielle Stebbins, Renewable Energy Vermont. Um, I wonder how, if there is an idea of proposing or sending out a health alert to doctors, does that not then, um, if there is a future desire to do a study, potentially jeopardize or you know change the data results? <laughs> produce a bias for a future study. So there seems to be a, a, a challenge here. I guess that's my question. How, how would you... We're, we're challenged by things like that constantly. When we have uh, an issue of health, it's almost always going to be complicated by concerns for privacy, for concerns of stimulating uh, patient questions that might not have been there before. but. It's a really strong relationship between the physicians and uh, the health department that would be uh, the way to discern whether or not it's going to have an impact the way that we communicate the questions and the way that we use the answers. Uh, healthcare has to have uh, an open channel of communications between each other, but they also have to protect the information that is gathered 
and we would hope that the way we ask the questions and that the way that answers are used would not bias into future studies. But it is a, a very difficult aspect of trying to do epidemiological studies about wind turbines. Um, and yet, there are methods within epidemiology to try to control for that confounding or that bias that might have occurred. And I think knowing uh, the record of people who have contacted us would be one way we would know whether or not there was some sort of bias in the reports that we uh, had seen from the epidemiological study. Yes, sir, in the back. Uh, yes, Mr. Commons. Can you say, you say your name, please? Steve Terry in Sheffield, Vermont. Uh, my question to you is, uh, how bad is it going to have to get, how many times are we going to have to contact your office, many of us, before there is any type of action, we're going on our third year. We are wore out. I move into your house, and I'm sure you're not going to let me. My kids are sick. I am sick. I need answers from people. I'm I sorry, don't sir. To... Sir, I understand how frustrated you are, but uh, I'm, at, I'm asking the question. I'm sorry, I carried away. But no, the, the, the topic of today for today was, was about the experts and the science of sound. It wasn't about. Uh, individual concerns that like the kind you're having. We had a previous session where we discussed that. You can talk to Mr. Commons off offline. We don't need it. We're, we're not here today to have the, a public discussion about it. So he, he does represent, you, you can't complain to the department, and I know you have in the past. Uh, I think you should go ahead and talk to him when we're done here today. Thank you. Any other questions about the scientific nature? Yes. Uh, Robin Clark Bull, um, when most of the experts testified today, they talked about a 40 dBA. How did these projects end up with a 45 dBA? That, uh, that has, I, don't, I think that, uh, I'm not sure you're right about that, but um, the, the, uh, the hearings that we had had testimony about that. But I, understand, I understand that, but it was through yes, the sir. World <laughs> Health Organization. Right. In a real simple term, the 40 dB is an annual average, whereas the 45 decibel is one hour average. So they're really uh, different approaches. <coughs> and my other question was to the intrinsic people. Who funded your studies? Robin, that's a great question. Um, one, the first peer review that Chris and I did, uh, we essentially did by ourselves. We were working with developers. And we were writing a lot of work uh, for them, but the published paper that we did had no uh, external source of funding. Uh, we did a review of uh, the Michael Nissenbaum study in 2012. That report was funded by the Canadian Wind Energy Association. We wrote a report for them and then took that and submitted it for peer-reviewed publication. And the other studies have no external funding whatsoever. Uh, part of the work that Melissa did was under her uh, postdoctoral fellow with me and the other one of them, I misspoke, the last one we just published uh, was just by us. One of the publications we did was all about electromagnetic fields. Uh, so we went to a wind farm in Ontario and measured electromagnetic fields at different distances from the, the wind farms. That was a study completely funded by Capital Power, Pattern Energy, and, um, Capital Pattern and Samsung. So that study was industry funded. The other ones were primarily <coughs> Thank you. Well. Yes. Yes, I'd like to ask a question because the studies referred to is DBA, and yet people talking about low frequency, infrared frequency. And I just want to suggest that in the city of New York, we, we, we do have some wind turbines, but basically our code, our noise code, was written before that. And in the code, we do measure low frequency sounds because people who lived over bars used to complain that while they were lying in bed, they could feel the bass. It was bump, ba bump, ba bump, ba bump. And they could feel it. And they began to complain to the city of New York. And so we introduced in our noise code, which you can find by going to the Department of Environmental Protection, a recognition that people can feel the sound. It can have an adverse impact on their health and that the city of New York is obligated to investigate it and, if possible, take some action. 
So I'm just using this as an illustration and so surprised that basically the research focused only on the GBA and not on the possibility, as Leventhal cited very early, ten, I mean, 10 years ago, that it might very well have an impact. It isn't hearing it. And the other comment, annoyance is not an appropriate term. Annoyance is what leads to stress. It is the stress that has a physiological effect on the body. And when you are annoyed, no matter what you annoy, and this I could speak to because I've written a great deal about it, if it bothers you, if you're upset by it, upset is more than a psychological phenomenon. It gets translated into the physiological system, basically the emotions, basically the sympathetic nervous system, and in the long run can have a health effect. And that seemed to have been not mentioned in the studies discussing annoyance, which are mentioned in huge amounts throughout the literature with references that I can give you. Arlene, you think you've got some very good points. Uh, you touched on a number of things. I just want to talk about a few of them. So the studies that Melissa and I talked about looking at people's level of annoyance in terms of wind turbines, and it was linked back to GBA, is, is true to your point, but people's responses, how annoyed are they, is based on what they're exposed to living near the turbines. So the people are responding, they're annoyed, they're rather annoyed, they're very annoyed, based on hearing audible noise and being exposed to inaudible noises like infrasound. So the whole spectrum of noise that comes from wind turbines, infrasound, low frequency, and audible, is inherent in their response. So really, when you talk about, and, and um, Dr. Bastich and Dr. Barnes and Mr. Ashitani spoke about DBA and DBC and DBG when we had the, the noise workshop a couple of months ago. And really, those are just ways to, to weight the noise. You take the computer, I'm not an acoustician, so I'm kind of stretching a little bit, but you go out and you measure noise. And then the acoustical engineers weight it differently, so you can take into account the low frequency spectrums, the audible spectrums. But the way that the body responds to it, it doesn't matter about that. The body responds to what the body is exposed to. And those studies that look at levels of annoyance are related to that, and not necessarily DBG, A, or C. But in terms of the different weightings, and Dr. McCunney can maybe speak to, to it more, there are a number of jurisdictions that have low frequency noise components. They're saying that DBA and DBC can't really differ than more than 10 decibels. Um, so that is taken into account in a number of jurisdictions. In terms of low frequency, uh, infrasound rather, there aren't a lot of, of guidelines for infrasound, but there are a good number of studies that have measured infrasound. And so, a great study came out in 2012 by Turnbull in the journal is called the Acu uh, Acoustical Society of Australia, I got that right, where they measured infrasound 25 meters, sorry, I keep using my Canadian units, 25 meters from a beach, a number of hundreds, 100, 380 meters from two different wind farms that had in that range of 1.5 to 2.1 megawatt turbines, which is you know pretty much the standard range that they're being produced right now, at a gas fire plant in the city of, city of Adelaide. And what they found was that 25 meters from the beach, the level of infrasound was greater than what it was coming from the turbines. So naturally, people are exposed often to levels of infrasound that are much, much greater that come from turbines. And these are actual studies that have been measured. So the whole idea that, that infrasound and low frequency noise aren't, aren't taken into account is, is somewhat true, but inherent in people's response to the turbines is exposure to those uh, things. Bob, I don't know if you want to expand on that or... Yeah, I, uh, I agree with you. There, there have been actually... We can see a lot of references. I'm sorry, I can't hear you. I, I apologize. There, there's a whole rich literature on actually field measurements of sound from wind turbines and all the various components, low frequency sound, infrasound, and so forth. And I could give you some references if you want to pursue the topic in, in more detail, but there is a fair rich literature. Also, I completely agree with uh, Dr. Knopper here about noise. I mean, in some ways, using the fragment that you have, taking noise and fractionating it into low frequency sound and infrasound, isn't a whole lot different than looking at environmental particulates and breaking the particulates into 
particles less than 10 microns and 2.5 microns and nanoparticles and so forth. So there is a fair amount of literature out there that's actually measured. Please let me correct. When you talk about sound, you can talk about physical measurements. You are not talking about noise. The noise is an interpretation by an individual that this particular sound is unwanted, uncontrollable, or disturbing. It is sound until it's interpreted when I'm talking about people. Sure. And so if you're going to acknowledge that these sounds have an adverse effect by using the word noise, then I really rest my case. You're talking about sound until you deal with people, until you listen to them, until you assess them appropriately, it's only sound. It then becomes noise after you research There's no, no question I'm very that, sensitive about There's that. no question that noise is unwanted sound. Right. No one will dispute you on that. Um, but in any event, there, can, there have been measurements of infrasound, there have been measurements of low frequency sound, and those measurements have been correlated. Someone here talked about the American National Standard Institute, ANSI. ANSI has guidelines for infrasound and low frequency sound for hospitals and schools. And the measurements in wind turbines vicinities have been contrasted with those ANSI guidelines. And at least the data with which I'm familiar in the published peer reviewed literature suggests that once you get beyond 300 meters, the infrasound and the low frequency sound generated by wind turbines meets ANSI standards for hospitals and schools. Right. So that was work, Dr. McConaughey was referring to work by Rob O'Neill. Uh, that was done in Texas in 2010. Uh, he, Rob O'Neill is part of a group called Epsilon, if I'm not mistaken, uh, acoustical engineers. And they went to a wind farm in Texas, two wind farms in Texas, and measured low frequency noise and infrasound inside and outside people's homes. And they showed that as close as 305 meters, the standards were met for ANSI, uh, Japanese, and UK guidelines. Uh, to, to, to what Dr. Okay, thank you for that. Yes. All right, time for one more, um, Mr. Blomberg. Yeah, I wanted to respond briefly to this whole idea of infrasound being everywhere. And it is. It's true that if you go out of the ocean, you go to a beach, you can measure it. What these two gentlemen have done, however, is totally ignore the arguments and position of the people who claim there's an impact. Because what the people who claim there's an impact are saying is that it is not the chaotic noise. The chaotic noise of the ocean, very chaotic. They're concerned about a very specific frequency that is coming through and can be experienced amongst that chaos. And so I find it very disingenuous to ignore the complaints of the people. Thank you. I, I, I realize this is kind of an inflammatory onslaught about ignoring the complaints. I'm not ignoring any complaints. I'm a science-based physician, and if there's a theory that infrasound adversely affects health. There are well-recognized scientific methods to test the hypothesis. It's irrelevant to anybody being dismissive or unconcerned about the symptoms that people are raising. I think that's really off base. I think it's off base, but and, or and we have, okay, so we're done now. Uh, thanks everybody for coming out today. We appreciate it. And, uh,